Oops. Hello, can anyone hear me? So if you're not here to witness this event, then you're in the wrong room. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about OpenShift and speeding up development with OpenShift. This is going to be sort of technical, but if you haven't really seen OpenShift before, you can probably follow along a little bit. Um, but please, as with any other talk we have here at, uh, at Dev Nation Summit, uh, we're here to get questions. Uh, we don't need to wait for the last moment to get them. So if there's something as we go on that you need clarified and so on, please let me know, and I'll be happy to answer them. So uh, I really don't have a lot of slides. I have a demo that I want to show. Uh, to me, that works a lot better than anything else that we can do. But before I get started, since this is very focused around OpenShift, I just want to get an idea of how many in here have used OpenShift for something in development perspective or evaluating it. Very good. So how many here are considering taking production? Are you still just evaluating? Uh, evaluating? Good. Cool. So, well, when you're looking at OpenShift today, when you did your first couple of projects, so can I get some vote here? When, how long did it take you to make your first compile of a project, even just Hello World? 19 minutes. 19 minutes? Anyone have, can beat 19 minutes? My first one took 23. But that was back in the better days. Um, but that's not uncommon, right? Long build times. And what I'm going to talk about today is part of the reason, explain why that is going on, and how, as a developer, we can bypass most of that stuff. I'm going to take these down to a couple seconds for you. As a developer, we have some options. And that's what this is all about. But yes, this is a very typical problem when we go from the traditional, I'm creating a VM, I have my full development so, uh, system on my laptop, and every time I do a change, I'm just updating it. We now go into a container world, there is no such thing as updating it anymore. And that means we have to do a lot of stuff every time. So who am I? My name is Peter Larson. I am a uh, OpenShift architect or domain architect in general. My role at Red Hat is when we do uh, advanced POCs with customers, I'm usually the one they, they invite out to help set them up or do deep dives for customers once we go into the more interesting types of questions that are usually not in the books. Uh, done OpenShift since version one. And it's been one of those products that I've been extremely interested in following because it, to me, changed the way I looked at software development. Uh, and that was the whole point. It actually grew out of that whole challenge of how can we actually make a tool that developers could use to do their job better. And then all of a sudden, we put that upside on it too. But it started as a developer tool, and it still is a developer tool. Uh, OpenShift 3 started almost two years ago now in a developer phase, or at least concept phase. And since at least the fall of 2014, we've had something on the books. And I've been there pretty much all the way, either looking at or giving feedback to how the product was looking back then. It's been an interesting journey. So go back to, why does it take that long? Well, the first problem we have is we're using Docker, right? Docker images is the core concept of what's behind OpenShift. Everything we do builds on another image. So when you do a new code build, it actually needs to get a builder image that has the core OS, the build tools that is necessary, and the runtime tools necessary to just inject your code onto it. So that's an image that needs to be retrieved. And the very first time you run this, it's not, out, it's not on any box. It needs to be downloaded. The next thing that happens is you have a Git repo. You need to put source code in there. A lot of people think that that happens in that build container. It doesn't. That is actually another container that runs that is responsible just for retrieving the Git. 
And out of that, it creates a, job, a, a tuple that is then injected into the other thing. So we have some I.O. going that you otherwise would not have. This is not a lot, but this is steps that you're probably not aware of happening. Then we run the build. I'm talking about Java, I have Maven running. That, depending on how big of a project you're doing, can take quite a while. Even Hello World can take minutes to do in dependency downloads alone. And if you are like uh, our office, Red Hat, it can take even longer than that because that uh, bandwidth in the middle of the day is not available, right? Once we run the build, we have to commit the image to disk. And then we have to push it back to a repository so it is available to be deployed. Now, luckily, Docker is smart enough to not take the full image every time. But the very first time we do it, it's the whole image. So that push, the very first time, is going to take forever. And then we're going to pull it again to the node that needs to run it. Now, that may be the same box. It may not. More often than not, if you're in production or in a bigger development environment, those are all different boxes. And by the time we're done, we've had lunch, we've had our cup of coffee, and we're done. And does anyone here think that that is a good method if you're trying to debug a problem to go through this every time? No, right. So what do we do? Why do we actually have this problem? Well, this is because we do everything based on containers. Containers, by default, are immutable, right? They don't change. Or you can try to change them. They've changed in memory. But next time you run it or you restart it, it forgets everything that it had and starts all over again. And that's why we want them. They're consistent. We know exactly what we're running every time we run it. But the problem is every time we want to do it, we have to rebuild them. If you listen at lunch to our lightning talks, the last one really laid it out from the organization, though he had those pretty slides up there, handwritten and all. Basically, you have to be sure that every project you depend on is, uh, is connected to every time you build. If you want to make sure you have the true Im image of what's out there right now, you have to do a full build every time because everything changes so fast. And you have a lot of dependencies that you may not be aware of. But there is actually a way around that. So let's actually look at some details of how that OpenShift build process works. So I already mentioned the build image. So these are images that come with OpenShift out of the box, but they're meant to you as a template. So this uh, uh, build image has a certain set of rules of how an environment would look. They, they, are being, they are meant to be customized by the end user. But of course, you can use them out of the box as they are, perfectly fine. But you may have some specific requirements you want to add or remove from these those standard images. But you need a build image to do your build, in, build on. Those build images doesn't just have the software on it, like EAP or PHP for Apache and so on. They also have the STI or S2I, uh, source to image, executable that is run to actually compile and build your code. Um, the good news is that that is actually available, and I find that some people are not really aware of that. That is also available for you to do offline. So if you want to actually create your own build images and figure out how it works, that STI can be downloaded and tested without having to go to a full build every time. There are two very important parts of the STI that is needed for build process. The most and my, the primary one is kind of assemble. It's a script. Whatever's in that script is run. You can overwrite that script in your Git repo. Or you could just use the one that is in the image. So you can fully customize what that process needs to be. It could just be that you want to call out to an external build system, have it do its job, and then retrieve the result. Or it could be a lot more advanced. You'll see a little later I'm going to talk about another script called Save Artifacts that is going to be very key for you to do what I'm going to talk about. And then we have the standard Java build process with Maven which by itself is a long-haired process. So this is actually what's going on. When you hit build, so this is a very high-level overview of a build process. We start by downloading the STI scripts or get a hold of them from our build image. 
I'm going to talk about an incremental build in a moment. So that's a feature that we have that can allow us to actually skip some of these steps. But if it's not an incremental build, which is the default, when you create a, uh, a build of anything, it comes out as a full build every time. It goes straight into downloading the source and adds that to my build image. And once the build figures out whether there's an error, if there's an error, it actually does a specific Docker build, injects all the stuff it's done, so you can go in and retrieve the error, machine, error codes and all the stuff that happens post-fact, because otherwise, when we kill the, the container, it's gone. We want to make sure we persist it so you can do some standard diagnostics on, on what's going on. If there's no errors, we go in and commit the image, and we're so basically done. You know, the, the deployment goes on. We, we, we send it to Docker and all the stuff that I talked about, or sorry, the Docker registry. And so on that we done, did before. But this, this is the build steps that we go through. So the incremental build does a little cute little thing that says, if it is an incremental build, I now have a new script that allows me to port or transport the artifacts from one system to another. And if it's Maven, it's the, basically the repository directory. So all of those downloads, all of those things that you've already created are binary moved from one container to another. So when Maven runs again, it goes, oh, I already got that stuff. I don't need to re-download it again. That allows Maven to finish up in a couple of seconds, maybe 10, instead of minutes. So how's the image flow going? Well, we talked about different type of images being created. Right? We start with our build image. And we start with Git, which is literally coming from another image into our build. We run our build, create another image here. So every one of these square boxes is an image. Start our commit, we put that in a registry, and then we deploy. And of course, we can deploy to any node in our infrastructure. If we deploy to the same one we build on, then this last process is pretty fast. It goes in and says, I'm going to you know, pull it down again. I, well, I already got the image. And Docker happily just starts it up in a couple seconds, and we're done. But why are we doing it this way? Well, it is a long process, but a lot of these stuffs are cached. So the second time around, particularly once you have all the nodes for the build image already cached, we don't do that. We basically only have the software build process left that takes a long time. But the other overhead are still there, and then still accounts for five, 10 seconds. And when I do development, that's still, by just those five, 10 seconds, is still a long time. This is why I want to have a local development always, so it was easier to test, right? As I said earlier, we can build in any node. Uh, this is actually one of the strengths of OpenShift. OpenShift actually allows us to cluster and create a complete compute node cluster of builds. We don't need to have separate build systems and figure that one out. We can simply set up special rules for all our builds so they are executed in certain areas of, of our cluster under certain priorities and so on. But it means they can run anywhere that the ops guys have decided that they want to run it. So when we even do our little hello world, it is actually that long process, and it is for every component that you want to build. So I did a kitchen sink from a hotel a couple of weeks ago. And if you're not familiar with kitchen sink, this is, uh, if you're starting out with JBoss, this is probably one of the first projects you're ever going to do outside of Hello World. It's actually the default project when you go in and say, I want to create an EAP project in OpenShift. So it took total nine minutes. And this was on a fresh install. There was nothing else on it. Of that, I spent the bulk of the time downloading the image on a hotel Wi-Fi that was slow. But as I said, I've seen slower networks elsewhere. This, the source was just a second or two. The Maven build took more than a minute. And then remember, this is a Maven build that downloads all its dependencies completely from scratch. And then it pushed it to the internal registry that took a while. Again, the first time, it has a lot of stuff to put into that registry and commit it. And then there was a little bit extra overhead for checking some stuff and so on. But it ended up about nine minutes. Also, if you look down here, it's actually nine minutes and 26 seconds or something like that. For a simple little program that has one table and a registry of three fields, right? So the challenge really is, as a developer, 
I can't develop if that's the long, how long it's going to take every time I hit save and I want to see if my code works. I, imagine doing that with something a lot more complex than a simple little system like that. So we deal with the dependencies. So we have our normal Maven stuff. And we deal with Docker and the flow that we have because we have to really persist and start over from scratch every time. So how can we get around that? Well, we have some options now. Tree2 introduced a lot of new options for build management. And the roadmap you're probably going to hear a lot about this week has a lot more of those coming up too for 3.3. So here's some of those that you can use today. Uh, OCR sync does almost like it says. It will inject the file directly from your file system locally into a running container. So if you're doing it from your local system where you have a binary or just an HTML file or something like that, you can inject it straight into your running container from the command line without building again. I'm going to end up with some summary on this, so I'm going to repeat some of the stuff I'm saying. What is the problem with that for production? If I'm injecting straight into my container, remember I did say they don't persist, they're all immutable. This is not a way of producing anything for production or even further steps. It allows me as a developer to test out some cool stuff that I've just done and I want to make sure it works without having to wait. But it does that just as fast as it would if you did it local. Then we have the concept of incremental builds, which is a single option. I'm going to, the next slide is going to show that. It's a single option to a build configuration. And what that tells OpenShift is to look for that uh, save artifact script. If it exists, then it will do an incremental build. If it doesn't find that script, it ignores the incremental build and just does a do a full one. And again, what that basically says is take all those already retrieved and compiled binaries from the previous build inject them straight into your, con to your build container as they are, then start your build. And as you know with Maven, it means that we can actually start from that point instead of from scratch. Again, same problem as before. We're not building all over again. So if you did that a week later, all those changes in that last week are not going to be part of your build. We also have some direct build instructions from the command line. Or, in general, anything that we do on the command line is, of course, in the API. So we can say from build on the com uh, into our OC start build command. And that basically says, take this directory or take this file and inject them straight from my directory into the build uh, image or the build container as they are, just like we could do with incremental. This just allows you to specify files from your own directory structure instead of what the former build was. We can do the same with from dir, which means it's very, very easy to basically, here's a directory that I created with all my war and your files and so on, again, Java speak, and I just want them deployed as is. And if you just wanted to inject a single file, we have from file. So it allows you to basically take your local environment that you have, where you have some pre-built artifacts that you just did with your IDE or your command line tools, just get them out and not do a go, do a go through the whole build again. So this is literally the change that you have to do to increment, to start up incremental builds. You have, to, so the default file that you'll get when you create a build, we're gonna see that in the demo, contains all the stuff that is not bold, and all you need to do is add that incremental is true. Now, the IDE, sorry, the uh, web console for OpenShift do not yet contain that option. It's coming. So it's a, let me edit the YAML file and add the line for now. Uh, if you're doing it from the command line, you can make your file and just uh, do an OC replace or something like that after you create it. But remember, the image that you're referring to, this thing, has to be able to support the save artifact script for it to work. So when we do our incremental build, this is what it's now going to look like. We take our previous build, grab our files that came from dependency into our build, we do our commit, put it to the registry, and do a deploy. So this part of the process is still the same, but getting the build done is now a lot faster. And 
once we have committed it once, because the first time we run it, we can't do incremental, right? Uh, so we already have an image, so that commit that we have is literally just that compile that you did for that one job file. It is much faster because of that. So async, as I mentioned earlier, injects file directly into the running part. And I really can't stress this. I didn't know if you're going to make those bigger letters and so on. They're not persisted. Once that part is stopped or scaled, those changes are gone. So again, keep that in mind when you do this. It is very good for the local instance. So if you were here for the, form, the talk just before mine, the CDK runs locally. It is great for development of OpenShift. It means as a developer, you now have a full OpenShift installation on your own box. You can, you can literally work offline from your corporate IT, still develop OpenShift artifacts, so when you get back in, you can easily take those if you change them and push them up to the OpenShift that might be running there. And running the CDK is very, very easy. It does not require to be an op guy and know a lot about VMs or anything. So the last one we've all known, right? if you've been a developer and you're dealing with EAP and you're just putting a binary, let's say you have a job file, sorry, yeah, you have a job file you change, or even a class file that you have changed that you want to inject. Well, part of the problem is that the runtime of, a, of the JBoss at this point, it will not necessarily see those changes unless you tell the EAP you need to redeploy this application. And that mechanism is still true whether you're using OpenShift or not. So as long as you keep that in mind when you do your change, you may need to send a signal to that running process that it needs to refresh so it can see your change. So that you know, part of your life is still there because that, that was there too locally. From built, so this is an example when I did that same build we saw before. Actually, so that was the second time around when I did it, when the image was already there, I didn't have to download it. So the first time I did this with the build image already on the system, but nothing else, it took about one minute and 10 seconds. I then created the incremental. I was down to nine seconds. Didn't change a thing. That's almost survivable. If you do a change, you may get up to 10 seconds, meaning you know, change a couple of uh, Java, uh, Java files or something else. It is all of a sudden much more manageable in time, but we can actually get it further down. So we have a lot of tooling for Eclipse, or Developer Studio as we call it here at Red Hat. Um, part of the tooling that comes with Eclipse is a lot of OpenShift stuff. And I'm going to show that in my demo how some of that works. But what it allows us to do is to literally do dynamic updates to our project. When I hit save, it literally, from that point, changes my, my uh, part content, and I can see the change happening live, running in OpenShift. No redeployment, no rebuild, no nothing needed. So the tooling introduces something called the OpenShift adapter. It literally, if you, if you remember the service tab on the clips, makes a server out of the OpenShift deployment that you have. And you treat it just like you would uh, treat it your own local server. You can do your push, you can do your publish, and all that stuff to that. And then we have a live reload server, which is something we borrowed from our mobile development folks, that injects a little piece of JavaScript to your web, web application that automatically refreshes when there's a change done in the ID. Don't need it, you can go and hit refresh manually. That works too. So let's take a look at this. So, well, I'm pretty sure I know the answer. I have a video I took because I don't really trust the wireless <laughs> here. Or we can try to do it live. What do you guys want to do? OK, I thought so. I just want to make sure I asked. OK. Oh, that's my video. That's not what you want to see, is it? OK. So here we've got an OpenShift instance. It's all local, um, but it's a standard OpenShift installation. That means that there's no really magic here. I have the same dependencies as you would have the first time you installed OpenShift. There's a lot of 
go out to the, the public world to do things. So let's create a project. I can try. Does that help? OK. OK, so now we have a project. I'm going to take a very, very, very primitive project that I have for EAP. And I need to burn down so I can actually see what it writes here for EAP 7. This will run on EAP 6 too. This is not specific for EAP 7, but I just grabbed this. So here's a simple GitHub, and I'm a little lazy, so I just do a copy and paste of the, the Git. Plug it in here. And, oh, I forgot to give it a name, didn't I? That's it. So here we go. Everyone has seen this before, right? So this is actually pretty busy. So depending on our network, this may take a couple of minutes. It may take a long time. And if it does that, I'll jump to the video, because I don't know what's going to happen here with the Wi-Fi. But the only thing that it skipped was downloading the build image, because I've already done that. So it went through. It got the Git data. It got the um, build image. It injected the, uh, the source code. And what we're now looking at is the result of the assemble script being run, which calls Maven. And as you can see, the majority of what it's doing is downloading. You guys know that from standard Maven. Now, you can speed some of this. You look, look at that. It's, I mean, most of what you see here is going to external repos right now, right? That could be sped up dramatically by having your own local nexus. But it's still going to download them every time. And you have 10, 50, or maybe 100 developers doing this. Uh, you, of course, need to have a lot of resources. But that's a lot of network traffic that you're going to spend over every time there's a, full, there's a compile. If you're going between having to do a, a full build maybe every night to do that every time you have a change. So there is a penalty, even from an ops perspective, to do all that downloading, even when it is local. But that is a, definitely a speed up to do that. Uh, so if you're on your VPN and going into work and it's going from a local work server to another, this should go much faster when you're the only guy, when you have a lot of them. And I've seen that happen when we have classes of 30 people hitting at the same time. You realize how uh, little bandwidth one gigabit is to actually play around with this. So just to make sure that we actually look at what it actually created here while it almost is done. I hope it will be almost done very soon. So is this, you know, I haven't really gone through OpenShift yet. So is everyone familiar with what a build configuration is? Is anyone here want me to sort of quickly explain how this is working behind the scenes? Nope. Good. So the build that we just ran, and it just looks like it's completed, is located here. And as you notice, it took about two minutes, which was kind of fun. That's what it took last night at the hotel, too. So yay, hotel. And Wi-Fi here at the conference is the same. Yes. So we have that. And we can look at our configuration. And I don't know if you guys have seen this yet, because I just found out we had this. Look at that. We now have a nice GUI for the build configuration on the web console. I didn't know we had that. Of course, we don't have the incremental option in here yet, but can't complain about that. This is the direction we're going with everything in OpenShift, that we want a lot of these things that you had to do through YAML files before to be that easy to enter from the web console. But what I need to do is to actually go in and add that incremental to my project. So I have to go to the YAML file. And when I can find my cursor, there it is. I add my incremental. And I say tr save. Now, we can go in and actually, just to make sure, actually, we didn't even look at the project being run first. Let's actually see the, the huge piece of code that we have here. This is a very simple REST service. And if I do that, it says, greetings, Peter. Right? It's extremely advanced code, I know. 
Um, but the advantage is it takes no time to compile. <laughs> so very simple. It's an HTML5 with a REST service in behind the scene. Does all the stuff that you normally have done when you do a demo of what a REST service does. So let's actually go in and do a change directly to the Git. And again, I have to move down here a little bit so I can actually see. I actually put a mouse up there because I knew I couldn't use this stuff. So, oops. This is not something I recommend trying to do edit from GitHub, but you can do it. So we can change that to Dev Nation Greetings, and I commit my changes. And now I can go back and do a build, but this time, remember I changed the configuration, so when I do a start build of this, it's now using the um, incremental build instead. So we go in here, look at the log, because that's the fun part, if I'm fast enough. So there we go. It's done with Maven. Right, it, did, it saw one file change, compiled that, and we're pushing, and it's already done. So if I go back into my build overview and look here, we reduced our time from 2 minutes and 14 seconds to 13 seconds. And this is a persisted image. Right? This is the right way to build, except to skip all our dependency resolutions. You had a question? Yeah, so, um, can you the, uh, uh, yes, I, I, you want me to do now? Sure. I can do that. You think I cheat, huh? Uh, I know. Oops. This is not fun. I'm not used to typing this way. There we go. And little mouse, little mouse, where are you? There we are. Okay, so now we can do a start build. It should be here. Um, do you need to look? Yeah, okay. I, I could have sworn I saw it not long ago, but that's just me. Okay. So there we go. It's doing its build. It's doing its Maven stuff again. And... It should end up about the same time. Yes, absolutely. So you're, the only thing that changes is that we are moving all those binary artifacts that we had in the former build to the new one, but we are running the exact same assemble script. So the script itself follows the exact same steps every time. The only difference is when it runs Maven, Maven goes, oh, I already got those files, so I don't need to download them again. Yes. Yeah. If you. If you in assemble has already set all of that up to be done as part of your standard process, absolutely. Now, I wouldn't necessarily want to put them in my assemble script, but you can. There is a better option called jobs uh, that runs post when the job is, you know, your part is deployed. So if what your test needs to do is, for instance, test scaling, then you can actually do that because your build actually doesn't run the code. It only builds it and then it commits it, and then it waits for the deployment to run it. Now, if you're using Achillean or something like that, it will run a little local one, and it will, you will be fine. But depending on what the unit test does, you may want to do a full um, build that way. Um, but that's what the job, and that was another thing that went GA with 3.2, was that we now have the ability to create 
a one-off part that runs only once for a specific period of time. Uh, you can set a limit if you want to, and that's great for testing. It's great for database initialization, all kinds of other one-off jobs that you may want to associate with your deployment of code or your build process. And that can, and it could also be a, a, a daily task that you want to do to clean up some stuff. So let's go back here, see how long it actually took. Ah, 43 seconds. It cheated. But it still took longer, right? So we have a little unknown in the network here that we can't, and that's the cool thing, right? I can do builds sometimes, and I'm the only one in the network, and it's cool and fast, and I'm happy, and then I come in when everyone else is using it at the same time, and I can barely get a website to load. Um, so we fight something in the same sense. So let me actually just put this back into incremental, because I actually want to show this from the IDE perspective, too, what we can do. Oops. I guess I need to learn how to spell. OK, little cursor. OK. So I will go to the IDE, which is located there. OK. So this is the vanilla uh, JBDS 10 that we just announced. Yes? It will, yes. So again, the first time you're running, so this uh, don't, it, it doesn't change any of the other stuff other than preparing the, uh, when you're doing the assemble with some prefix files. So if you've never run it before on a new node, let's say your ops guys just added one more machine because you're running out of capacity. Well, that box, every time you deploy something new to it, it goes, I got to download that. And that will be the same here if that's part of your build box. It will have to download that. So none of that changes from that build perspective. Now, what I'm going to show you with JBDS has, will not be impacted by that. Yes? I'm sorry? Uh, um, so as long as that uh, saver um, artifacts is implemented, yes. This is not for Java. All OpenShift is caring about is that someone implemented a script that says, here's all the artifacts that you have to move from one system to another. So if you have a Python and you know exactly what that directory is and what those files needs to be, then you put that in that script. It creates a tarball out of it that it then transports over to the other end. So any language that has binary artifacts like that is supported. Now, I think right now we have it only in a few out of the box for Red Hat, but, and, and OpenShift or EAP is one of them. And this is why I use 7, actually, because that was the only image I found that actually had it implemented because it got released about the same time we had this feature available. <laughs> so inside the IDE, and I still can't, I have to bend down here like this. So I now have a project. If I do a refresh here, I'll see here's my Dev Nation project. So OpenShift and, I, and the JBDS are connected just like you connect to servers, you know, EAP, Jump, Tomcat, and so on, and get them to show up. So we have an explorer here, and I have my project. And all I need to do is I can import this project into my IDE by just clicking on it. So this now uses the OpenShift build configuration and other stuff to know what the code is. And it creates my artifacts out here. And you can now see that it actually is linked up to my Git already. It, it cloned it from the Git. It did not just copy it down from an OpenShift thing, it used the artifact defined by OpenShift and went out and, go, and grabbed them from there. So this now looks like a normal project. The only thing I need to do is to create a server adapter. So when I go on to my server tab, I can now see OpenShift running in here. Oops. So notice what's happening when I do that. When I create a server adapter, it literally goes in and says, well, this piece of code, this deployment created a WAR file. It changes that WAR file to an exploded WAR file. Why? Well, because now it actually allows you to change files directly and replace them on the running server. So I did that for you without having to do anything. So when I now do stuff in here, and um, well, we could go back in here. Oh, let's actually do, 
This is why I did the video, so I remembered everything I had to do. Let's t bring up, oh, I want to run it from the, uh, from the IDE, actually. So I go into servers, and I say, I want to run my application using the live reload server. And, the, and it then asks me, do I want to inject a little piece of JavaScript to do a live reload automatically? And I go, sure, that will be nice. See, my big application has no problems with that stuff. It is extremely fancy. So here's the application running. Notice that it's going on localhost. So I'm actually looking at my local environment right now. But my application runs in OpenShift. So all that right light reload did was to basically port forward requests coming locally, grab what I'm doing, sending it on. So it still works. Should say hello, uh, DevNation greetings there, because that was the change that we did, remember? Just before we did the incremental. So now we can go in and say, well, let, what happens if we want to actually change stuff here? So we can go in and just pretend that we just want to change the, um, ah, the greeting, for instance. Instead of world, we say the nation, right? So I'm going to hit save and then see if I'm fast enough to go to my browser. And that's changed in OpenShift. Yes? So that's, it. so that's actually my next step. And it's, it's a combined question of both, both of the yes and a no. Right? So the problem we're going to run into, let me try. So let's go back. And let's grab our Java resource. Nope. Because it compiles it locally. So let's change this to summit, because that starts tomorrow, right? I hit save. And I go back to my browser. And of course, if I now should say hello here, we expect it to say summit greetings, right? But it didn't. Well, go back to our developer studio, and we can certainly see down here that it injected. So this is why I had this little pointer, so I could point to it for you guys. So down here, if you can read it in the back, it says that I actually could recompiled the service, and I pushed in the class into the running container. But it's not showing up. Why is that? Well, that's because the deployment uh, descriptor in JBoss does not see individual class files change by themselves. It has to be told that that deployment is sturdy and has to be redeployed. So right now, and I have not found that as an automated thing. I am sure I can make sure that becomes part of it, because that's what we do with the EAP side. We just do a push, automatic push to the server, and that's all it does is tell EAP, please reload the um, deployment. So all we need to do, but we can do it manually. So it is one click away. Go down here, and it's called restart. I, don't, I did not get published to work. I don't know why, but I can now go in here, and I can say test, and it's summit screens. So with that restart, it still took much, much less time. And with the push, it should also take just about the same. All that does is send a signal in the deployment directory that you have to redeploy, and it's over in like half a second, just like it does today when you develop locally. So those are the mechanisms in play. Um, so there are certainly the same problems you have today with when you change code. Make sure that it, where you're changing it to, it sees the code change. But other than that, it's that simple. We can now inject directly. Yes? So I don't see that option. And I've talked to several or at the experts basically said that it's not meant to do that. It, it's meant to see the change to the, to the, to the wall file. It, uh, so if you touch that in the deployment, and that's really what Publish does when you hit that. And for some reason, and I, I'm filing bugs on that, I can't get that to work in the current version of the tooling that is out there. But that's what it's supposed to do. You had a question? It injects very few pages, uh, very, uh, two lines or something like that. So let me see if I can pull it up here. Um, ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da. There you go. That's what it does.
Um, and that literally came out of our mobile development. Right? So when you do mobile phone development, you can literally take up your simulator of your mobile phone on the side, and as you start developing, it changes it. Pretty cool, but why, re why re reinvent that wheel? We already have it. So we're using the white light reload here too. So I will jump back to these slides for a sec, just to finish up a couple of things. So we have a lot of features that I haven't shown yet from Eclipse. Um, absolutely one thing true. If you want full implementation of all the features of OpenShift, that's the command line. But this is not a um, small list. Right? So we can do everything from port forwarding to do new deployments to create applications from, you know, create new applications, build images. So I started from OpenShift. You might as well just start from JPDS and then make it into an OpenShift deployment. It doesn't have to be the way I did it. Um, JPDS 10 allows you to scale parts. Now, as a developer, I don't think I've ever needed to do that. Uh, unit testing or integration testing, yes, but definitely not from an IDE. But it is there now because it's a very simple thing to do, actually. Um, well, I don't want to go through them all because I think we are sort of getting close to the timeline here. Don't want to bore you too much. We talked about the service adapter. This basically saves the local files or, and that triggers a server publish. And as I said, I can't get that to work. Uh, so that's a bug for me. If that works correctly, then we shouldn't need to do a re uh, reload of the server when we do code change. I managed to get GSF code to change. I managed to get all types of code to change that does require some level of compile, but class files, not so much. You can certainly do all of this without a developer studio. Developer Studio doesn't really introduce features you don't already have in command line. It just makes it a lot easier to use. I don't have to write commands after I hit save and so on. But do remember, I didn't do a push to my Git repo, right? I changed my code, which created a binary compile. It got pushed up. Nothing went to Git, which means when I do a rebuild on OpenShift, am I going to get my change in now? Nope. I bypassed a lot of steps in order for me to just have a reasonable response time from a developer perspective. So that brings me to this thing. While we have no waits, oh, a second or two, uh, it's a lot faster, your debugging and all that becomes tolerable. We are not persisting. This is absolutely not recommended for anything other than just local development. Once you get out of that, um, you want to do builds the, the standard way. You want to trigger a build whenever you change code, at least whenever you create a new branch or something like that, that says we're now ready to do another test of all our code. That still is need to be there. None of this replaces that. But it makes it possible to be a developer with OpenShift without having to replicate the environment locally and still, still, still take advantage of all of that stuff. There's a small potential conflict between the local JDK that you have and the JDK used on the other side, if, unless you make sure, because developer studio is what does the compile. But as long as you make sure you're on the same major version, I doubt you're going to find that irrelevant for most of the stuff you're doing. Again, you will never deploy the EN code other than from what compiled from that same JDK that is on OpenShift in the end. So it shouldn't be that big of a conflict, but it is potential there. So if you really can't get it to work, maybe try to do a full build and see what happens. So I hope, uh, to finish this up, that from this, that whenever you see the big past discussions and you see those long wait times, that some of that scare of, I can't be developing those environments have been taken away. That was at least the intention of doing this, to, to help understand the developer side of OpenShift is not as bad as it sounds. <laughs> um, it's meant to be a developer tool. And this is one of those many, many features that we have that can do that. I've only shown a little bit of the build configuration tooling that we have. There is a ton more in it, and there's a ton more coming. Uh, I'm, I wish I had the slide that basically told you about all the OpenShift sessions. I probably should have made that. Um, but there will be a 
big uh, session tomorrow and one Wednesday on OpenShift and roadmaps and where we are. This shows a lot of these things in, in, in play. It's, uh, I can, if you're interested in OpenShift, look at what's coming, and I think you're going to be amazed. So with that, any more questions? Yes? Yes. So with anything OpenShift, uh, that's part of the core architecture. I can only get access to the parts, which is what we call our containers, that is inside the namespace that I'm locked on as. No, if I have access to the part, uh, but other than view, if I only have view rights, I can't do, do that, that stuff. But if I have any other rights, then I can do that. So if I have access to the running ones with more than just being able to see what's out there, uh, and those are the privileges you can control, uh, those are commands that are available, yes. But you have to have right, uh, more than just view rights. So you've got, you got to be careful with what you do. And that's actually a tree tree feature about how you can manage teams from the console and not just from the uh, command line. Makes that easier. Uh, every time I see that, I think back to version two that we have out because that was a feature we had there for a long time with the nice users on the side. But it's coming for 3.3. Three, three. Yes? Why is the uh, incremental build or default? It was just introduced. I, I have a, so remember, the problem with incremental is it does not do a new resolve of dependencies. So it could mean that you don't see certain things. Now, Maven, in general, should find them. But the idea, again, when you do a build, is you want to make sure that that build is consistent. And I see Diogenes in the back basically repeated what he said, you know, do a full real build every time if you want to be sure you have a high QA of your service. That should not be what you do as a developer, though. Right? That is your build system running automatically in the background somewhere else to verify that everything is fine. So you can easily have two build configurations for the same source code, or three or four with different options, with no problems. So you can have your project as a developer that you're playing around in, and then you have the same branch. So you may have a separate branch that you control that goes to the build system. So whenever you think you're ready with code, you just merge it into that branch, and that build system will see that. And it will just fully do a complete build from scratch that everyone knows this is exactly the bits that we need. And there's no cheating gone. And it can take 10 hours, or so whatever, how long it's going to take to build everything. But remember also, this is why we talk about microservices, right? We don't want a huge build. We want a lot of small ones. Yes? Yes. I'm basically treating my pod or my container as if it was running locally, happily, as if I'm in my local environment. And it's good for that purpose only, but it's, it's good for that. But remember, the whole idea of your, your train of, you know, one of the things OpenShift will do is it will trigger rebuilds automatically if dependencies on your containers change. Right? So if you update your, let's say, your Apache container for your PHP, because well, that was a security update that you need to do. It will automatically trigger builds and so on. I think it's about time that we wrap up here. <laughs> I see someone looking in here. Um, I'm here all week. Uh, absolutely, you can find me down there. Please remember to do the evaluation forms. Uh, they, uh, as, um, as we said before, they really help us what works and what doesn't work. Uh, it helps me too, because if I get a lot of good points, then I get rewarded too. So. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. I appreciate it.